I don't think I'm going to do what other people do where they have an introduction and they say, oh, and this is the person I'm interviewing. I'm going to assume that most people listening to this know who you are, and if not, a little bit of research on the internet will help with that. Okay. As far as where the career is and whatnot. However, one thing i got to ask, because I always forget it, what year did you start being a head coach? Um, 1990, get this right, 8. 1990. Okay. Because I always get that mixed up with when you started being a junior high coach, and yeah, yeah, I I, I was I was junior high coach for two years, ninety six and ninety seven. Mm-hmm. Were you a good junior high coach? Um, I I don't know. I mean, we had some pretty decent teams. One really cool thing is the the my first year, the seventh graders, I had them for two years in seventh grade and then in eighth grade, and then I moved up to the high school, and so did they. Mm-hmm. And their senior year, we won a, a state championship, which was kind of cool because we had been together for six years then. Sure, yeah. And, and uh, so, yeah, we got to know each other. Other, I mean, I knew those guys inside and out, which, mm-hmm. was, which was kind of a cool deal. And that reminds me a bit of, uh, of uh, Matt Fowler, where uh, Chuck Lambert was his head. I think, mm-hmm. I think he was his junior high coach, then he was his high school coach, and then he was an assistant at Sterling. Right, uh, so yeah, I think yeah. Matt played 10 years of football, and every single one of them, wow. Chuck was on the sideline. So, that's pretty good. Now, of course, he doesn't have any championships as a player, but that's still pretty cool. You know? Yeah, so. for sure. So you're very well associated with the 32 defense, which has there been a year you've coached where that hasn't been your base? Um, No, there's been years where I thought it wouldn't be, and we tried other things and just keep coming back to the 32 because it's what I know and – and I know how to adjust it. And, and, uh, so, but yeah, there's been years where we just didn't think we could find, you know, whatever position it was, a couple linebackers or a defensive ends and thought we needed to do something different. And, and every year we tried, uh, we ended back to the 32. So I, have, I haven't done that for a long time. So you say it's about comfort and you know, the system, what is it about the defense itself? You think that keeps you using it and makes it the most popular one in the state? Um, I think it just the way you can adjust, um, you know, even even teams that get, you know, don't run the three two when when they start getting spread out mm-hmm. a lot of times what they get into will start to resemble a three two. And I just think with that free safety, um, there's so much adjustability to different formations. And I feel like, you know, even against today's offenses with shifts and motions and you know, unbalanced um, and, and just all the things that offensive coordinators are throwing at us, the three, two still gives us, you know, puts the kids um, in the best situation, you know, to be successful against whatever they're trying to do. It seems to me that it's funny because when I drop a 32 and Mark Coles has made the same comment more or less that a lot of plays look really good against it. You know, you get everyone blocked uh, among the linemen and backers and, you know, you think, okay, this should be a decent play for us um, in ways that, you know, a 33, for example, it might be harder for mm-hmm. partially because there's more guys near the line of scrimmage on your run plays. It's just, all right, getting all them accounted for can be annoying unless you're doing the single wing or the option or quarterback ground game, something like that where you have the extra blocker. But it seems to me that the 32 also prevents big plays the best partially because it has three defensive backs and also because you can play cover two and cover three really easily from it. Um, Mm -hmm. Whereas in a 33, I mean, Mitch Engelkin told me once that they would play cover three sometimes out of their three, three because they had Cody Hyman, who was just a freak, but you can't really rely on having that kind of athlete on your team. Um, It seems to me that three, three locks you into cover two quite a bit if you're going to play pure zone. Um, So the flexibility of it, as you mentioned, the ability to, prevent big plays is huge because an eight man so much of it is uh, so much of offense is getting big plays i mean the rushing yardage averages the passing averages and so forth um you know there's more space relative to the number of players on the field and i think the 32 handles that uh, quite well yeah i would agree and Mm -hmm. it's 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 had to change and adapt you know with with back in the day with with the reads and things we did um, offenses have caught up, and so we've had to change a few things. But all in all, the base, you know, the stance, the base fundamentals that we teach are, you know, have stood the test of time. What have been the biggest changes that offenses have made since you started? 
Um, I think just, you know, formation wise, I feel like, you know, 20 years ago, a team maybe ran two or three formations um, and several of those would be double tight. And so just the preparation, um, you know, for the nowadays, you just get multiple, multiple formations. We're that way, too. We love to, you know, just try to formation teams to death. And it's it's just harder to prepare because, you know, what they do out of each formation um, kind of dictates how you try to set up your defense and having to uh, do that with so many formations. I feel like that's a different. And then just the teams that are doing the, the RPO stuff and there's a lot of more, uh, you know, the passing games have become so much more complex, uh, especially these past couple of years that teams are just doing some really cool things that, that you know, as a defensive coordinator, just uh, make you bang your head against the wall. Yeah, RPOs bug the heck out of me because, you know, I come from the, I, I'm one of Matt Fowler's pups. So, you know, read the mm -hmm. guards, read the guards, read the guards. So when they show pass yeah. look, it's just, all right, we dropped our zones. Everything's cool. We know what we're doing, but they're a bunch of filthy liars. You know? <laughs> it's awful. I mean, right. Wichita County ran a play against you guys in this most recent state game where uh, I think it was two wide receivers each side. They showed pass, right? And mm -hmm. then Hermosillo started running forward as if to draw, and then he threw deep down the right sideline to a guy on a go round. It's just as a defensive back, how the hell are you meant to read that? Yeah, you know, you're reading the guard. Okay, get to your zone, but then you see the quarterback because you're reading the quarterback at that point. I'd imagine, right? Yeah, it's just that is so obnoxious. Well, and and especially that type of athlete. I mean, he mm. was he was just special, and so it made it made it so difficult. Oh, certainly. I mean, they had personnel, very very good personnel. Mm. Um, yeah, I want to say as a side note, some of the hits in that game were just, they were loud. And I was sitting, you know, at the back of the stands on the home side and it was awesome. Some of the, some it was of the violence in that physical, game. Physical, physical football game. What you'd mm -hmm. expect, at, you know, at that, at that level. And sure. uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a fun game to coach in. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, pretty magnanimous for the guy who came out on the losing end of it. Well, I, I can say that now a little bit removed at the time. At the time, it was fun. You know, I felt like our kids were battling. We had had a lot of injuries. We'd move some kids around. I felt like we were battling yeah. um, and hanging right in there. Unfortunately, a couple turnovers, you know, really swung the momentum. But I couldn't fault our kids. The effort was there. Uh, you know, my best wide receiver is now playing guard in some positions. And you're just like, e even so, um, at one point I looked up, I don't know, and it's it's starting to mist and rain and and uh, two good teams just fighting it out, and I just couldn't, you know, but thank the good Lord for putting me in that spot. And and uh, so there, there's a lot of good things, even though those uh, those losses in a championship game they they sting for a while. I think the way I the way I always tell people about that game is that it's such a shame that one of those teams had to lose because I thought both were worthy of being champions. And in a lot of years, I think you guys would have been champions against various teams that you might've played. Um, some championship years are like that where it's just doggone it. Why are both these teams so good this year, but they have to play each other. But at the same right. time, it often leads to great games. Sure. Um, sure. I'm curious. I, I've talked a little bit with Tyler O'Connor about this a few years ago. Um, Versus a single wing look, so you've got a wing back and then two backs behind center with an unbalanced line. His adjustment to that, assuming they wanted to run sweep a lot, would be to widen the defensive end a little bit um, so that he can't be hooked as easily. I'm mm -hmm. curious whether you have any general philosophical thoughts on how to deal with teams that like to pin with the with a wing back, whether it's to run toss right. or run some sort of direct snap sweep, uh, and the wing in general. I, I Have you coached against it? You know, I, I have not, and uh, I'm very thankful I haven't because I've put in, you know, Coach Fowler's teams and watched them on film and just been, how would I defend this? And uh, some of it comes down to personnel, what type of defensive end you have over there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you cheat the safety to that side and maybe roll that corner up so he doesn't have any deep responsibilities. And and uh, then you got to pay attention to where the wide side of the field is, but – you know, I cannot say I've I've played a true I, I've had teams get in it a little bit, but as far as it being just their absolute base offense and that's what they do, I have not had the opportunity to coach against that. Okay. All right. So let's say in a week Mark Lentz comes down, he announces there's been a new rule change. I don't know if Lentz would do it actually, it'd probably be somebody else, but 
says that you're no longer allowed to run a 32. It's illegal now. Can't do it. What defense, <laughs> would, what defense would Kevin Ayers run? Oh, man. Uh, I'd call it a 34. We'd run the 3-2, but I'd roll the corners up just a little bit more so it was a 34. How about that? <laughs> you know, that's funny. I asked Matt the same question in an email a couple of years ago, and he said the same thing almost word for word. He said he'd call them outside linebackers, and it'd be yeah. a 34. Yeah. I don't – I mean, probably the 3-3. Three, three. I mm-hmm. mean – you know, there's some things that in, in it that give give teams fits, and a lot of times we will we will adjust our 32 into a 3-3 just to give teams a little bit of a different look, um, more of a gimmick thing. Definitely not our base, and but probably a 3-3. I mean, I'm a little intrigued with all the you know the two four and the two fronts that have come out, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I can see some merit with that, but I don't have any experience with it. So, uh, but yeah, probably three three. The thing that annoys me most about the two four is how unpredictable those guys can be with yeah. the tackles and the backers. It seems to me they can create a lot of havoc just by stunning and blitzing, um, yeah. yep. which is obnoxious. It seems to me that a really good passing game would be one partial antidote to that. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, looking at it on paper uh, back in the, I guess, back in the day, a long time ago, uh, a four two was the most popular. That's what everyone ran was a four two with man coverage, and uh, the two four is basically a four two. You just walk your defensive ends off a little bit and do some different things. So there's there's a little bit of that. Um, I think you know if you're solid on in the interior on the offensive line, you know some veer and some things like that can really get going against that those inside tech, depending on what they're doing with them. Yeah, for sure. What about the five one? What do you think of that defense? Um, you know, that's what uh, my first year as a head coach. That was some people called it a five one, some a three five with the the three tech tackles and you know the Mike backer in the middle, and that's what I ran. Um, and on paper, I think it looks really good against the you know what when a team is in a, a twenty two personnel, but when they start to spread you out, um, it gets a lot more difficult mm-hmm. uh, just to. Uh, control some of the gaps and then i think people can formation and motion you to death in that and it's it's hard to adjust to yeah for sure really good run look though and yes uh, it is yeah. i mean if you've got a couple of stud three techs and a, and a good mic you can you can uh give team spits yeah certainly so tell me a little bit about this leadership camp that you run uh you talked about it at the clinic briefly and i know mark has signed us up for it i don't know exactly when we're going i need to check that but Sure. What's the purpose of it? What's done there? Um, So this is something we started. uh, This will be the fourth year that my team has went through it. Um, And a good friend of mine, Guy Gaskell, uh, has set up a camp at Wilson Lake. And uh, it's, it's, I guess, Guy's dream is to just help as many kids as he can. And um, we've got involved with with a couple of other guys who are, are passionate about just, you know, trying to give youth some direction. And uh, the curriculum we use um, isn't necessarily set up, you know, for football, but we, I guess we bend it and twist it for that reason. And it, you take your seniors and um, you go through a program. It's a lot of work and, and, and a lot of play. We have a lot of fun. It's really fun as a coach to kind of relax with your seniors um, usually you're in practice and you're intense and you're trying to get as much done as you can. And so to go down there and just build, rela- you know, the coach player relationship and then walk them through an interview process that gives them what we call their signature gift and uh, what they what they are going to bring to this world, basically why they're put on this earth. And um, then we tie it into how they're going to use that for their team. Um, and then moving forward, we, we give the team uh, – a, what we call uh, the gift. What's this team going to bring, you know, to the, to our school, to our community? How are we going to help uh, make it a better place? And so it's really cool to see, you know, number one, when athletes learn what their, their gift is, uh, it's kind of an aha moment. And then to, you know, visit with them, well, how are you going to use this in, in school, in our community, on our team? And uh, definitely gives me as a coach a little window inside of them and, and uh, can really work on that. You know, you get down in the season and, 
and you're needing a particular thing to happen with the chemistry of your team or, or something like that, and you can pull on those gifts and uh, really call on those seniors to bring that to the table. And then it's really fun to watch what they think our team is going to be about. And uh, last year, our, our seniors came up, our team is going to be all one. And then, uh, you know, talked about how we're going to do that. We don't want anybody to feel like they're above or below. We want them to feel like everybody is all one. And, and then, uh, you know, the, the strategies we're going to do to make that happen. So it's a pretty special time. And uh, we pulled in. We It's just been uh, teams from Little River until last year. And then uh, Grant Stevenson brought down the Plainville kids um, for our first one that wasn't one of our you know, one of my teams. And um, we learned a lot. It went well, but we also learned a lot of things that we can do better and, and just excited to get it rolling and, and really see it hopefully impact a lot of schools and a lot of teams. Fair to say that the relationships you build with players and that last uh, beyond their playing days is a big reason why you took up the profession and continue in it. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it's, it's more important than, than, uh, you know, winning state championships, uh, it's really cool as a coach and, and all these coaches out there that have been doing a while when a kid calls and invites you to their wedding and or calls and says, hey, coach, I had a I had a little boy. And, you know, those things just transcend uh, the sport and to me are what what makes. And I don't know. There's something really special about football for some reason. The, I don't know if it's the physicality of it. Um, you know, it's it's a difficult sport. There's something that just draws a team together and I think draws coaches and athletes together, too. A very dramatic sport. Things happen. You can have a bigger swing in a football game than you can in, I think, most other kinds of games. I mean, for example, in tennis, it's impossible to have a play where, uh, I don't know if you know the scoring system in tennis, but basically it's impossible to have a play where either player could win or lose the match right then. Right. Because right, it's always yeah. win by two. Um, yeah. In basketball, you have so many more possessions that a steal, which would be our equivalent of an interception, isn't as big a deal unless it's in the last moments or something like that as it is in football because we just have so many fewer possessions than you do in basketball. Exactly. Um, funnily enough, I guess it's the most like baseball in the sense that it's a turn-based game, right? You run a play and then you stop for a bit and then you run a play and you stop for a bit. It's not continuous like soccer or basketball, but yeah, very dramatic. Uh, the violence is a part of it. The pain, the, that's definitely a part of it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that... that... When you go through hard things with with other guys, um, physically hard, mentally hard, I mean, there's just something something that happens that draws you together, and I think I think you hit it that football is is kind of special in that way. Is that what drew you to it initially, or what got you into coaching? Um, I don't know. I loved all sports growing up. I mean, did the football, basketball, track, and and uh, I was just one of those kids who. It's just whatever season it was, that was my favorite. Um, and I, I love to compete. And uh, uh, I guess I, I, I played football in college, so that kind of, you know, I guess drew me a little closer to, to the game. But my first year is teaching. I coached all three, you know, football, basketball, track, and, and whichever one I was in, I loved it. But I think, I think the thing about football is, is exactly what we talked about. But then also it's just – the, the chess match is, is so much fun and, and, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to, you know, defensively align or how we're going to move their players so we can have some success. And, and just the whole, the whole chess match that happens, you know, as the week goes on is, is something I really enjoy. You talked to the clinic about how when you're a younger coach, you know, you would work your guys very hard in practice and in conditioning leading up to the season and that nowadays you're different and that, you know, you don't push them so hard early on. Um, and the expression feeds the cat, feed the cats was used many times by you and mm -hmm. others at that clinic. I hadn't heard it before. Um, you give us a rundown on what that is, how it contrasts with how you used to coach and so forth. Yeah. I mean, feed the cats is almost a polar opposite of what I used to do. Um, you know, it, it used to be we were going to outgrind people and that was going to make us tougher. We were going to be in better shape. We were going to be more physical because we had endured so much more in practice. And uh, there's a lot of good things that come from that style of coaching. I mean, I think the kids were really mentally tough. You had to be. Um, I look back at some of the things I, I put my teams through and I, I really would like to call those kids and apologize because it really was just 
what can we do to inflict pain and make this team as absolute tough as they can be? And it, you know, and, and it did do that. I mean, man, we had tough teams, tough kids. But I also feel like it, you know, took a little of the, the fun out of it. And also, by the end of the year, our kids were just beat down. I mean, mentally, maybe even more so mentally, but also physically, just from the grind that, you know, especially if you did make it, you know, into the playoffs and, and, and your season extended, um, you know, for another month. I mean, by, that, by the time you get to that championship game, teams are just beat down um, and, and emotionally, mentally, physically just weren't playing at the level that I wanted them to. And uh, when I first got on to feed the cats, I, man, my gut reaction was like, this is going to create a bunch of weak – uh, mentally weak, physically weak kids and that are not going to be tough enough to play the game. But the more you, the more you dive into it, I'm always kind of intrigued by things that run, you know, opposite of, of what the standard culture says. And so the more I got into it, I really started to like what it was going to do for us at the end of the season. Um, I, I think our, our kids enjoy practice a lot more and not that we have to make everything fun, but when that equates to a fresh team that's excited to play on a Friday, that's excited to come to practice, um, I feel like you get a better product. And at Feed the Cats is just sprint-based training. We, when we go, we go all out. Um, and when we rest, we rest. And we hardly ever just condition to be conditioning. If we're going to do something, we're going to be in a competitive drill doing it all out because I, you know, that's how I want my teams to play when the ball snapped is, is all out and then we'll rest. And it, it was freeing as a coach too, because now I'm I'm not trying to outgrind other coaches because you know trying to do that is just a weight. You're constantly, you know, do we need to do more? We need to be in better shape. We got to be tougher. And and now it's all about we want to be as rested and as fresh and as excited as we can, you know, to play the game on Friday. And so it's it's really maybe even more on the coaching side it's more enjoyable to coach that way and not such a a grind on me it's okay to let the kids you know we can get to a point where yeah you know we're not just going to stay out here for another hour to say we did we're going to get them in get them out keep them fresh and uh you know i think it really has helped our teams especially at the end of the season you know play some good football it seems to me if you were to equate the teams you had to a personality that your early teams were hyper masculine in the sense that you know we're gonna outman you basically we're gonna beat you up and so forth which is as masculine as it gets right you know when it comes right. down to it yeah if, if two men yeah. have a serious disagreement physical force is part of it uh and it's going to be about will and it's going to be about um discipline and it's mm -hmm. sort of an maybe overbearing from the authority within the structure right, right? Yeah. you know which yep. obviously can result in a lot of success but at the same time, you know, you lack some of the creative, you lack some of the spontaneity. Uh, as you say, it's not as fun, perhaps. Uh, there's a lot of right. pressure. It seems to me that nowadays with this approach, you're more balanced between the two. Because obviously you guys still play really physical football. I mean, I don't think anyone could reasonably call you soft. Um, yeah. But at the I mean, same I, time, you have both aspects. Right. And I, I think there, there's a balance there. I mean, we still are, are physical in practice. It's not mm -hmm. like we're not playing physical style of football. It's just we're not doing it for an hour and we're not thinking of the absolute worst conditioning thing I can think of. How many kids can we, you know, get to throw up or, you know, we're going to break their will, you know, that that's just not a part of it. And so um, much more enjoyable to coach. And like I said, we were, I think we got fresher bodies and, and fresher minds. Uh, and that includes coaches being fresher at the end of the season. Well, I think part of it is, you know, you are dealing with kids. It's not having to fight with them so much. When I started out as a teacher, I was very, I think I have to say authoritarian here, where it's just, you know, you do not talk while I'm talking. If you do, I'm going to come down hard on you. I was, right because um, I was a young teacher, I didn't know. And mm -hmm. uh, I've got my own issues dealing with people, thanks to thanks to the autism. But, you know, over the years, I've just kind of recognized, you know what, they are freaking kids. They, you know, the boys, for example, they need to needle you a little bit. Um, right. Otherwise... I mean, they're going to be antsy as heck, and that's just going to cause other problems, and that's no good. So I try to build it in where, you know, we can have a little bit of banter back and forth. I'll poke at them as long as they can keep it school appropriate. They can poke at me. That's fine, you know. 
Sure. Um, you want to be able to have that with kids. And, you know, if they're having a little bit of fun, they might indulge you a bit and listen a little better, or at least not disrupt stuff, you know, at least not cause right. problems, which is what you want. Uh, you want to be able to get done with the work. So having yeah. kids that, as you say, are enthusiastic about it, they're happy to come to practice, uh, that's a huge deal. I mean, you can't force people to feel a certain way, that's for certain. Right, yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, I don't think kids have changed. You hear that a lot. Kids have changed. Kids haven't necessarily changed, but society has changed a little bit. And, um, you know, I think people can get on board with the feed the cats and uh, see the merits and the, and the really good things. And, and like I said, my, my biggest worry was, are, are we going to be physical? Are we going to, you know, and I, I feel that we still are a physical team and, and we find ways to do that other than just, you know, run a kid in the in the ground mm -hmm. so i think this is the second or third time that you basically predicted one of the things i wanted to ask about which was kids today and i agree i don't think the kids really have changed certainly not genetically but i think culture has changed somewhat and i think technology has changed too when i was in school uh there were phones but they, they weren't all smartphones like they are nowadays it seems to me they have so many more distractions now to keep them away from sports or to give them an alternative because, I mean, you know, the extreme example is, you know, you got those older coaches, you know, who are 60 or whatnot saying, oh, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't wait to go to practice and all this. Well, yeah, you had nothing else to do. Right. It's not as if you could pull up every TV show ever and binge watch it, um, <laughs> among other things you might do with your phone that we don't need to get into. But, you know, there's so much distraction for them nowadays, so many diversions, so many other things they can do. Do you find that kids are less eager to participate in sports nowadays than they might have been when you started out? You know, uh, no, I don't. It's, I mean, that's a little bit of a tough question, but I think you, you've got to make football something special that they want to do, that they can see they're getting some good out of it, that they can see, you know, when I go to football practice and I come home, I feel good about how I helped my team that day, about, you know, the, the physical aspect. I became a tougher young man. I learned how to deal with adversity. And I think if kids realize that, that they're getting this stuff out of football, you know, they want to come. Um, and, and Feed the Cats feeds into that a little bit because, you know, uh, to make the choice of, of go coach just beat the tar out of me uh, or to go home and play a video game, I mean, that's, you know, some kids are going to decide that, that maybe it's just too hard. And so we make it hard in different ways. And I think we make it a, a rewarding in some different ways. And uh, I think kids still crave to be a part of something, to be a part of a team. Um, I think they crave to work hard. I really do. Um, you've got to kind of teach them how to crave that. And we try to make work fun around here. If, if it's a hard thing uh, that we're doing in practice, I mean, we're, we're, uh, you know, the guys are hollering, they're getting after each other and, and trying to make work fun because work can be fun. You've just got to find that right approach. This seems to me to be something that we have wrong with uh, the general culture in this country, perhaps the world too, the idea that you want to get away with doing things with the least possible effort. You know, you want to, the ideal mm -hmm. state would be nobody had to work. Everyone could just sit around, which seems to me so backwards because it's, I think we need to do things that we need to have something that we're engaged in. Otherwise life becomes, uh, hellaciously boring. Yeah. Um, Meaningless. I, I totally agree. I, yeah, I mean, I see that in, in my own life. It's like, you know, you you feel like you're working all the time and then, you know, you go on vacation and in three or four days, I'm ready to get back home mm. and get to work. So I feel like I'm, I'm accomplishing something. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a balance as it are most things in life. I mean, um, I think you balance that with your team. You're, you're tough on them and then you love them up. And, and uh, you know, that, that balance is, is key. And, and there's no doubt that kids crave work. I mean, they may not think they do, but there's, there's no doubt. I can see that, you know, in a daily thing in, on the football field and in my classroom. Yeah. And what was the other thing I was going to say? Dug on it. Oh, right. So, and this is another aspect where I've grown over the years. And I don't know if you have too, but, you know, early on, kid – decide not to go out it's kind of well we don't want him almost you know it's just well if it's not for him you know or whatnot or if he can't see how good football is if he can't but nowadays i look at it as well no there are all sorts of reasons why a kid might think football might not be for him you know he might think he'll get hurt which fair enough you might um he might think that it's too hard he might think that he'll be embarrassed or whatever it might be 
and it seems to me the responsible thing to do is just be a good ambassador for the game because not everyone sees football the way I do where, you know, there, there are coaches out there where if football went away, they would survive. I mean, part of me would die if football went away. I mean, it's, it's part of my soul, right? You know, I mean, I couldn't exist. I mean, I'm not saying I would off myself, certainly. I mean, no, but right, I wouldn't but... be the same human being. Part of me would be gone, right? right, um, right. Not everyone sees it the way I do, you know, um, who have a passion for it. Uh, and so you need to be able to communicate how great it is to other people and, you know, be more welcoming. I think that's probably the best way I'd, you know, describe that change with Feed the Cats is that it's much more welcoming. It's, hey, you know, you can do this. I mean, it's going to be difficult, but it's also going to be fun. You know, it's enticing, right? You know, right. it's not right. this, oh, it's a terrible grind and it'll make a man out of you, but boy, it's going to be hard, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I think, I think you got to get your, your program hopefully to the point that it sells itself. When mm-hmm. kids are walking the hallways, uh, they're talking about, you know, hey, you should do football. You would love this. You would, you know, really enjoy. You'd get a lot out of it. Um, and when kids can see the value in what you're doing, and uh, and that doesn't mean, you know, I don't I feed the cats. I think sometimes gets a little bit of a bad rap that it's easy. Mm-hmm. Um, there are things we do in practice that are not easy, you know, with with tempos and and uh, but it's it's. I guess from the maybe more so the mental standpoint is easier just because, you know, uh, we're going to work, but we're also going to rest and we're also going to have some fun. And I mean, uh, rest is necessary yeah. for learning I mean, yeah. and, and for that, muscle growth. Thing. I've learned the most is is recovery is huge throughout mm-hmm. your season. You know, being a strength and conditioning teacher, uh, just uh, I used to think, you know, it's just how hard we work. It's just how much volume we can get in and. And uh, you get older, wiser, and start listening to people that are a lot smarter than I am. Start talking about, you know, the importance of recovery. And I think that's one thing feed the cat really does help with is is recovery. So you mentioned the program would sell itself. I think one of the coaches who did a great job selling his program was Coach Mack from Madison. But Coach McLean, mm-hmm. I should clarify, I can't comment on McMillan. I don't know him so well. But uh, some of the things that Fred did was. So every time one of his guys got a turnover in a game, he would get it. So if you got one turnover, your first turnover as a high schooler, you would get a shirt that said Bandit on it. I don't know if you've heard of these. And mm-hmm. on the, on, yeah, okay. So on the back, it would say, you know, wanted by Lyon County League coaches or whatever. Um, and if you got five, you got a different color one. If you got 15 or something like that, there was a lady in town who would make these shirts for him. Um, and I think if you got 25, which I think maybe four of his players ever did, it would say America's Most Wanted, which back in the day was a big TV <laughs> yeah. show. So, yeah. um, you know, he had that. Um, I kind of took that and I did something similar with my junior high kids where they would have wanted posters up around the school. You know, I mean, you know, have you yeah. seen this bandit, you know, $3,000 well, reward, $1,000 for every turnover, you know, wanted by lacrosse, Ellenwood and Central Plains or whatever, you know, the teams that he'd taken the ball away from. Um, or he said that, you know, what you should do is get, have someone take pictures at your practices and just post those around the school of kids playing football, having fun, whatever. Um, every Thursday, the day before games, they would have a pride run during their practice. They'd end their practice by running to the, I guess, town square in Madison, whatever that would be. And, uh, you know, present the team to the town and I guess have a little pep rally. Uh, Coach Mack would talk about the game this week, what's coming up, uh, who the offensive and defensive players were the week before and that sort of thing. Kind of get the town involved, um, which seemed to me to be a really good strategy. I know Matt Fowler does some – I think they do bonfires before every game, and he reads some sort of poem he's come up with, usually making fun of the other team a little bit, which, you know, I'm fine with that. That's, yeah. It's good to sure. have some banter. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Mm-hmm. All good fun. Well, I think all – all you know, good coaches have their way or their thing, and it doesn't have to be – and that's why I tell all these these younger coaches coming up. It it doesn't have to be someone else's. It can be your deal, um, but you need to have you know something that just sets your program apart a little bit, or, or things that you do, um, you know that that make it special. And you know those are the memories. Those are the things when you get back together with your your teams and your kids that you talk about. Remember when um, you know there's just just things that that uh, stick out in a kid's mind. And uh, it's always fun to when they come back to sit and listen to them, you know, talk about those. How many of your former players are coaching right now? I know a few of them. Oh, boy. Um, huh. I think six. Um, 
and there I'm getting old enough there there may be some that I don't know about uh mm. you know especially uh back in the Jetmore days and and uh I guess I'm getting old enough that that uh you know you lose track of those kids it's hard, I hate to say it but um I'm not a I'm not a big social media guy so I'm not on I should be on Facebook I guess and I could keep up a little better with them but I believe there are six of them all right so you were at Jetmore for a number of years. You won a couple titles there. Very successful. I don't think you ever had a losing season. Then you went on to Sharon Springs where you had more success, won a title, appeared in another one. Uh, then you took some time off from, I think, 2014 to 2016 as head coach. Were you an assistant during those years? Um, yes and no. Uh, Jeff Hinnick, one of my former players, took over for me. Um, and the first year I helped him a little bit. I kind of wanted him to you know, completely take ownership. And I helped him a little bit, you know, we'd get together and game plan and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, you know, would, would set up in the booth and help him a little bit. And then, uh, uh, did that for two years. And then the, the third year he was there, I did actually, I helped him a couple days a week. Uh, I think on a Tuesday, you know, your big practice days or Tuesday, Wednesdays, and then was on the sideline with him. So, uh, yeah, did help him a little bit. So, obviously, up until that point, you'd had a ton of success as a high school coach. By my count, never a losing record. How did those two, three, and six years you had when you came back to Sharon Springs, How did, did that change you at all? Did it affect your outlook? Because uh, it had to be a new experience for you. Um, you know, those are two of the most rewarding years I've had as a football coach. Um, I knew um, – I got, I got out of football and got out of teaching. I just – it had consumed me and I, I struggle with this still. Um, when it's football season, it just becomes uh, all consuming. It's, it's what my brain thinks about when I'm eating. It's what my brain thinks about while I'm brushing my teeth. It just, uh, and we had had some really good success at Sharon Springs and it got to the point where, you know, if we didn't make it to a sub-state championship game, it just felt like a failure. And I, I was, I was just, putting too much pressure on myself and, and I, I didn't have my priorities where they needed to be. So for context, for those listening, Sharon Springs yeah. had made the sub state game the last five years and two of those, and one of those years had made a state game. So, you yeah, know, certainly people were used to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think you know, the pressure just started to get to me and mm -hmm. um, you know, I had a young family and it was just, I felt like I just really needed to spend time there and uh and just get my priorities back. And I, I didn't expect to go back to coaching and teaching. I, I got in um, a really good family, um, needed help on their farm and ranch, um, the Pierces and Homestead Farms. So I, I worked for them for, for those years. And, and the first year is the best decision I ever made. Um, I was outside. I love to be outside. I'm an outdoor guy and uh, working with animals. And, and uh, it was great. And then the second year, um, started to miss just the boys and football and teaching. And, and by the third year, I knew I'd, I'd made a mistake. Um, and it wasn't what, you know, I guess God called me to do. I was put on this earth maybe to be a, a coach and a teacher. And so uh, when Jeff uh, decided to take the job at Oakley, um, my position opened back up. And I went into it knowing there was not very much talent, but, man, they were great kids. I mean, great kids. And some, they are some of the best practicing teams I had. Um, we struggled on Friday nights a little bit just because we weren't real talented. But, I, I, you know, there's a couple years there where we maybe shouldn't have won any games and we walk away winning three. And it's just I, I loved coaching those teams and, and loved those boys. This is something that I don't want to say annoys me about Coach of the Year awards, but it usually goes to the guy that wins the title. Or, you know, you get the, the weird year where uh, uh, Simon from Dighton will win it because his team had nine players and they made the sub-state game. A lot right. of the best coaching jobs are done on teams that have basically no talent, but they manage to scrape together a couple of wins or be more competitive than they have any right to be. Totally. Um, agree. And those, totally. those strike me as a couple of examples of those because, as you say, low talent and fairly difficult schedule uh, when you go and look at it. You know, you got Hodgman County, you've got Dighton, Otis Bison was still good then, uh, St. Francis was on the schedule, Atwood, Hoxie. Right. I mean, there's a lot of teams there that are really strong year to year and I mean, some of those teams have made state games, you know, in the interim or soon thereafter. It's um, yeah, not as if it was easy. So yeah, um, these well, yeah, those those years were special. I mean, I like I said, 
um, have so many good memories, uh, just as many there as you do with the state championship uh, year. It's just, uh, they're just different. For sure, yeah. Well, and I think it makes you appreciate uh, those years where you do have more talent and the ability to have more success is because it's harder earned. You know, you have to scrape for it. You have to fight for it. You have to be more creative. Uh, the yeah. pierces you work for, are these the same pierces as uh, that number 30 kid you had who played nose and running back? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Are, they, they're part of that family. Really nice player. Yep. So two years after that, you were at Little River and you guys finished six and two in the regular season. You lost in overtime to Clifton Clyde. Um, and you, I think Ken Yellow beat you by 18. So not a blowout, certainly, but they were the defending champions. They were the better team. You know, I think people expected right. them to repeat. Um, then Madison upsets them in the playoffs on the road, and you've got to go to Madison to play them. I think most people around the state would have said, all right, Little River's the underdogs. I mean, I imagine there might have been some people who even thought that Clifton Clyde would beat you again, which I, okay, whatever. But right. obviously that didn't happen. You got past them. You got past Chase County. Um, you know, this is very different from your 2007 team, your 2003 team. You know, this team lost a couple of games, came in as underdogs in more than one playoff game. Um, talk about that game. I was there. I was, you know, uh, I'm a good friend of Coach Max, or mm -hmm. I guess he's a mentor of mine, so I was looking forward to seeing the Bulldogs make it back to state. I hadn't even paid attention to you guys much. I didn't know the rebuilding job you were doing there at that point. But I was just uh, very impressed with how you beat the hell out of them. And uh, I thought Cade Schaefer, your center, had – the most outstanding night I'd seen a center he have did. since yeah, he did. maybe Zach Nemechek against B&B &B in the 2009 state title game. I don't know. He was killing it. Right. And it yeah. was, it was brutal. It was simple. It was great to watch. Um, yeah. Walk me through it. Well, I mean, I think it's one of those games where, uh, you know, in that first half, um, we just caught so many breaks and, uh, if football is a game of momentum, it just really is. And because they had a good team and Coach McMillan does a nice job. And, and uh, you know, physically going in, I thought, man, we're just kind of outgunned in some spots. But we were able to grab that momentum early uh, and get some points on the board and start playing with the lead. And I felt our offensive line, you know, was doing a, a really good job controlling the line of scrimmage. And we were just making first downs. And uh, the game plan that we had going in was not – I thought we were going to have to formation, motion, do some things just to get, you know, some matchups. And uh, when we got the lead, we got in a, in a double tight formation and pretty much ran, you know, veer option, a little quarterback run game for a majority of the game just trying to eat clock. So it didn't go at all like I thought it would. But, um, you know, that happens. It just – especially when the momentum swings and then you got to be able to keep it. There were several times where I thought – you know, it was really going to swing back the other way, but we had some playmakers on that team and we were able to just, just keep, you know, grabbing it back. Something that struck me, I think you guys might've been up 20 to eight or something like that at halftime. You're up by a couple scores, I want to say. And, you know, for those that don't know at Madison, you basically run past the scoreboard if you're the visitor out the fence and then around the fence to the, to pass where the visitor stands are. There's a locker room there. Um, and I just remember looking at them and seeing the confidence on these guys and they were hyping each other up, but it wasn't, it wasn't wild hype. It was, we know we're going to beat these guys almost, you know, we are confident. And, um, you know, so talk about some of those guys or that team in general. Well, um, you know, it, it was a team that, that had a, I won't call it a young offensive line. We were, we were juniors, but had not been tested, you know, had not started a lot of games. Um, with a pretty dynamic backfield and some, you know, some playmakers, Jaden Garrison, uh, who made the Shrine Bowl and, and really did well in the All-Star game that year. Just a super dynamic player. Just, you know, any way you could get him the football, uh, whether you threw it to him, handed it to him, or whether he was throwing it. I mean, they're just we, we just moved him all over. And, you know, Grant Stevens in the backfield uh, could throw it, and he was more the fullback type. And so we ran, we ran our stuff. And our offensive line just continued to grow that year. And I think they were the unsung hero, uh, you know, as we moved on into the season and just, uh, how much better they got. And by the end of the year with those dynamic guys in the backfield and an offensive line that had improved so much, we just, you know, we, we could, our offense could do some really good things and defense could hang in there and, and keep it close. So, um, yeah, fun team to coach. Yeah, certainly. I mean, 
you guys ultimately prevailed 48-24 over them and went on to the state game where I'd say you were underdogs once again against Wichita County. They came in undefeated. I They must have been the highest scoring team in eight-man that year up to that point, I would think. At least in Division One, I'd have to yeah. go and look at Division Two. I'm trying to think who was the – I guess probably Hanover. But, probably. I haven't yeah. been there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and still a great team, uh, very talented in their own way. And uh, it's a wild game. It's one that I probably need to watch a couple more times because there's so many swings in it. Um, Crazy. Yeah. yeah. It not, it's not normal, that sort of contest. No. No, not at that level. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I think uh, we made them punt one time. There was one punt the whole game. And other than that, it was, it was score. And score and score and score and score some more. So uh, I had former players calling me and ask me if, uh, you know, would, do you need me to come play defense again, coach? Just kind mm-hmm. of, you know, jabbing at just because of high score. Because I think I feel like our teams have kind of been known for being defensive ball clubs yeah. um, in the past. And, and uh, yeah, we, we could not stop them. And thankfully, they could not stop us. And it just was a. I mean, uh, I think it's the highest scoring state championship game in the history of Kansas, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think so. Um, what do you think was the difference in that game? Oh, that, that one punt, if you want to know the truth. And uh, right right before halftime, um, we had some really good things happen. Um, we stopped them, had a good punt return, scored, and got an onside kick. And so – those two possessions, right, being able to steal those um, were the difference in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, if you like points, that's the state championship to watch. It, yeah. Oh, and almost, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily like points. I'm, I, mm-hmm. I thought I was kind of more of a defensive guy. but Well, I was uh, using the indefinite pronoun uh, you, just a person yeah. out there. If uh, <laughs> you, the person listening to this, likes right. points, this is, uh, right. this is the game to watch. Um, yeah. And obviously the last two years, you guys have made it back to state and fallen short, partially due to injuries, partially due to running up against really, really darn good teams. Um, is it how, – how does that weigh the expectation, you know, whether it's around the school or the community when you've had success like that? Um, is it a burden? Um, yeah, as a coach it is. I mean, I'd be lying if it wasn't. There's there's that pressure. Uh you know, to get back, you know, well-meaning people say, oh, you'll get, you'll get them there, coach, you'll get them there. And, and, uh, you know, uh, there's just that pressure to do it, which is a good thing. I mean, it's, it's good to, you know, have expectations and, and, uh, you know, our kids seem to really just rise up to those expectations. This next year, we, we have two seniors on our team and, and four juniors. So we're really, really young. And, uh, it's it's but the expectations are still there and you know i think our kids feel a little bit of that pressure but th- i think they also welcome it because uh you know they want to live up to what the you know their brothers that have gone before them uh you know have built this and done the dirty work and uh, we just had camp today and we're talking about how you have to be willing to do the things um in football that aren't fun um mm-hmm. right now we're in camp we don't have pads on we can't hit anybody and it's it's really a, a mental thing, um, you know, and, and a lot of teach time, a lot of, a lot of technique time. And those are not the fun things, but I think with the expectations, kids are more willing to, uh, you know, jump in there and, and, and do this stuff that's not so much fun because they know it's produced, you know, some, some good things. Fair enough. One concept that I love in any competitive discipline is that of rivalry when you have opponents that meet each other many times um sometimes with a clash of styles sometimes they're mirror images you know great example of that is smith center and uh st francis back in the day where they're both running exactly right. the same stuff um what are some of the rivalries that you've enjoyed most over the years oh boy um you know you, you go back to the the Jetmore days and at that time spearville was was really good and just down the road and that was probably our biggest rival um, we also, uh, you know, South Central, Coldwater down there, um, and Ashland. And, and a lot of it for me as a coach is, is, is about who you're coaching against. Um, you know, some of those guys are, are really good friends of mine, um, down there and, and you just, you just enjoy coaching against them and you've had real competitive games. And, and so that produces a little bit of a, of a friendly coaching 
you know, rivalry. And I would say that same thing, you know, transferred over to, you know, here with Kent and Galva with Tyler O'Connor, you know, being a kid that played for me and I've gotten to know their staff and a lot of respect. And, and so, you know, that rivalry has, has grown and, and, uh, in Sharon Springs, it was definitely Tribune. Um, they were just down the road and, and, uh, so they were our rivals. Well, a little bit of, of Weskin too and old Mark Coles because we were only, you know, 11 miles apart. So, mm. uh, and Mark became a, you know, a great friend of mine um, through that rivalry. So it's, uh, they, can, they can be a lot of fun. For sure. Um, Kent and Galva is the one that went the most back and forth over the years. I think they won the first couple, then you won two, then they won the last one. Um, and obviously yeah. both teams won a title during that span and, you know, you guys have another couple of appearances to show for it. Um, what was it like going up against them? How do they differ from you guys? How are they the same? Um, what factors play into it? Well, I mean, you know, from a, if you just look at schemes schematically, their offense is a lot different than ours. Um, defensively, I'd say we're pretty similar. Um, you know, with Tyler running the defense, he obviously puts his flavor onto it. Um but, you know, Brad Willems, who is an assistant for me, is also an assistant there now. And so I, I always feel they have a really they, – they know all my secrets because with Tyler and, and Brad coaching there now, they know my program kind of in and out, inside and out. And so, uh, I don't know, I need Kent and Galva kids to come over here and be my assistant, I guess. Maybe you just need to change up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. If you, ever need, if you ever need single wing uh, tips, uh, Matt and I will help you out with that if you want to join the there Brotherhood. You yeah, we'll, we'll initiate you. We'll do the whole blood ritual. <laughs> it will be an initiation. Yeah, for say. sure. Um, going back to the 32, um, Tyler's told me this and Matt's told me this. Uh, I can't remember if you've ever said this, but I get the sense that you want to put your best athlete, best player, broadly speaking, you know, body type, you know, notwithstanding, at linebacker, right? That you know, the two guys that are your biggest studs, your best players, unless they're just built to play something else, you want right. to put them there. Is that right? Well, here, here's, here's the thing. I feel like, you know, a linebacker tends to draw the, the biggest, fastest kids. But if you want to talk about what really makes the 3-2 work, it's the defensive end. Um, right. Just because it is so hard to play there, you have to be so disciplined. You're not going to get all the tackles. The things you do don't necessarily show up in the stat book. Uh but, yeah, you know, if, if you look at your two linebackers run sideline to sideline, you can throw your free safety into that as well. You know, those are the guys that are you need to be – they need to be able to run. They need to be physical. Um, but without really good defensive ends, uh, you know, all that kind of goes out the window because you've got a tight end hammering down on your linebacker and it makes it a lot more difficult. So I always feel like the, the defensive ends are the unsung heroes in that defense. Right, so the way I put it, um, the way I heard it from Coach McLean was that he's of the mind that if he had only two studs, only two good players, right, to play on defense, he would put them at D-end. Yeah. And yeah. if the next two best would go at linebacker, whereas I think Tyler would say, you put your best two at linebacker. And I think with that is, it's the idea that if you have solid players across the board but only two studs, you'll get the most out of them at linebacker. Right. But yeah, I, if you've got kind of sub par players at every position, but you've got two studs, they'll save you the most trouble at defensive end because they'll keep the defense from falling apart all the time. Cause it's really easy for bad defensive ends to make the defense fall apart more so than bad linebackers will make the defense fall apart. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's well said. It okay. just, I don't mean, I mean, Oh, you can say your studs play linebacker, but the two most important guys on the field mm -hmm. are your defensive ends. Yeah. I tend to be more in that school of thought. Yeah. Um, you were a three, uh, hand in the dirt defensive end guy for a long time. And I believe recently you've switched to stand up. What brought that on? Well, um, yeah, I was a hand in the dirt guy. I always just felt like it, it got our pad level down. I felt when we wanted to stunt, we were quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, I wanted us to be more physical. And there were times when, you know, we'd have certain types of defensive ends come through the program who just were way more comfortable in a two point and we would put them there. Um, and so that, that was kind of our philosophy all the way through until the move to, uh, little river here. And then, uh, coach Lafferty, my, my defensive coordinator turned it over to him and he's a stand up guy. And, um, so yeah, just a little bit of me, you know, giving him some control there. Um, and th there again, either one is effective. You just got to coach it up and get your kids to play, you know, low and physical. And he does a good job with that. 
Coach McLean told me once that the reason he had his guys in two-point stances was he always thought if you're down low, you're going to bury your face in the guy's pads. You know, you're not going to see anything. You're not going to be able to read properly. It's, right. I don't want to say easy to take plays off, but you can fall asleep maybe a little easier doing that. Um, mm-hmm. Same time, you are easier to base block. You know, it has its own weaknesses. You know, no defensive right. adjustment is perfect. Um, that's just the nature of the game. So yeah. I thought I'd end this with uh, kind of a fun activity for you. So, you know, if I think all-time great 32 coaches who are still going, I mean, you're one of the names that would come up, and probably the first name, I would say. Uh, I don't mean to come off as a sycophant, but that's just how I see it. <laughs> so I'd like you to put together an all-time 32 team but you can't pick guys you've coached. So oh, guys you've yeah. coached against or guys you've seen on film, whatever. Coach. Yeah. Coach, that's, that's and this way, hard. this way you don't tick off any of the guys that have coached you where one of your backers are like, Hey, I was better than him. How dare you? You know? Yeah. But I can't, I can't even, I can't even do that. There are so <laughs> many good kids. I mean, you gotta, you gotta realize how old I am. Yeah. That's... That, that spans a lot, lot, lot of years. Okay, and so I, I would leave, I would leave some off just because I'm old and forgetful. So you man, want to just I, give a you, few you for each position me, group that you just you come to your mind. Me, you got to give me more uh, more time. Okay, how about this? If you had to go back in time and recruit one of these guys to play on your team, who are some of the defensive ends you might go and recruit? You know, it's just okay. This is the this guy plays it the way I want him to play it. He plays football the right way. Who would be someone like that defensive end? Mm. <laughs> You're talking defensive ends. It's hard for me because you know, if if it's a three-two, um, that they, they it's you're going to narrow it down to guys that just played three-two. Uh, you, you that know, you think hard. could play defensive end the right way. I don't. You know, you can pick yeah. whatever. And if you want to do the linebackers instead, I don't care. Any position. Wow. That's too hard. I'm, I'm <laughs> not gonna, I, I can't pick one. You, you, Darn. you make me pick a kid over a kid where I'm like, ah, that wouldn't. I well, don't you know. can pick multiple ones, just, you know, some ideas, but that's fine. Uh, you know, it's uh, it is a big question. And you have seen a lot. That's some time. We'll, we'll do this again. Yeah. In a year. Time and let me write some things. Right, down. Right. On the spot. I'm like, wow. I just, there's just been so many, uh, really good football players that we could mm-hmm. not get blocked that it just uh and then to come up with their names that's the hard part because oh, yeah. i could give you their, i could give you their numbers fair enough that number that number 10 but then trying to come up with his name is another thing and i'll embarrass myself so okay so uh, how about how about this instead to end it if there's a young coach out there who or a young guy who might be looking to get into coaching or someone who's new to the profession and is struggling with it um what would you tell him well, I, first off, I would say you are so needed. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about how society has changed. Um, and But society needs manly men. And I think football is one avenue. It's not the only one, but it's one avenue that you can create uh, manly men, men who are, who are mentally tough, physically tough, able to handle adversity, um, but even more importantly, see the bigger picture that, uh, you know, you weren't put on this earth to be the biggest, toughest. You were put on this earth to serve. And, and football gives them so many ways to, you know, serve their teammates, uh, serve their school, serve their community. And so being, you know, a young coach that can come in and facilitate that and you can have a big impact, not only on your school, but just on, especially these 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 players' families as they grow and they become, you know, uh, husbands, fathers, um, just knowing the right way to go about your business. Um, I know football really taught me a lot in that, and, and I'm really thankful for it. And I had great uh, coaches, Coach Rush in high school and then Coach Kessner in college who just were, you know, it, it was more important what you did off the field than what you did on the field. And we need more coaches like that in this business. Everything meaningful in life comes with responsibility. That's for certain. So, mm-hmm. yeah, well, thank you. do appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I'm going to kill the recording here, and I'll probably talk to you again in a year. I uh, really enjoyed it, Coach. Thanks for having me on. Anytime.